Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for coming out. It's a treat to be here. Um, uh, connects me with some old friends of mine from Egypt um, uh, and, and new friends. And Ted, thank you for organizing uh, this as well. Great, great to be at Claremont. I, I was here maybe a decade ago. There's a, is there an Athenaeum series? Yeah. It was, I, I, rem I remember that fondly. Um, so I'm going to talk about my, uh, my new book, uh, Thank You for Being Late. An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Acceleration. The first question I always get is, uh, where from the title of this book? Uh, and the title actually comes, uh, emerged quite accidentally from uh, meeting people in Washington, D.C. Uh, over the years for breakfast. And I don't like to waste breakfast by eating alone um, when I could maybe be learning something from someone. So I often schedule breakfast uh, with people downtown uh, in D.C. And um, every once in a while, someone would come 10 or 15 minutes late. And they say, Tom, I'm really sorry, it's the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And um, uh, one day, about three years ago, I said to one of them, uh, Peter Corsell, who's an energy innovator, um, who came late and, and, and started uh, uh, apologizing, I, I said, actually, Peter, thank you for being late. Uh, because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> Fascinating. I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. And most importantly, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. And people started to get into it. And they'd say, well, well, well you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> because um, they understood I was giving them permission to pause, uh, to slow down, uh, to rethink and reflect. And this book is an argument about why uh, that's so important right now. Um, the book actually uh, was triggered, in fact, by an accidental pause. Um, when I paused to engage with someone, I normally might not have. Um, I live in Bethesda, Maryland, and I take uh, the subway to work about once a week or so uh, when it's running. And um, uh, three year, almost three years ago now, uh, I did that. It involves for me driving from my home in Bethesda to the Bethesda Hyatt, and I park in. There's a public parking garage there, and I take the red line into DC. And I did that, went to the New York Times Bureau there, came back at the end of the day, got my car, time stamp ticket. Um, I drove up to the cashier's booth, gave it to the cashier, and he looked at it, looked at me and said, I know who you are. And I said, great. Um, he said, I read your column. I, that's, I said, great. Uh, he said, I don't always agree. Uh, <laughs> I thought to myself, get me out of here. Um, but uh, but I, I actually said to him, um, that's great, it, it means you have to check. And, um, and I drove off thinking, that's really great. Uh, the car guy is reading my column, and I felt good about that. Uh, a week later, I took my weekly trip in, DC, red line, came back, car, timestamp ticket, same guys there. Uh, and this time he says, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog, would you read my blog? And I thought, oh my god. The parking guy is now my competitor. <laughs> what, what just happened? So I said, well, write it down for me, and I'll look at it. So he tore off a piece of receipt paper, and uh, he wrote down odenambi.com. And I went home, and I called it up on my computer. And it uh, quickly was obvious that he's Ethiopian and writes about Ethiopian politics. He's from the Aroma people, and um, from a very um, uh, pro-democracy point of view. It was a good blog. Um, I thought about him for a few days, and um, I told my wife, and I, I decided that this was a sign from God, and that I should actually pause and engage uh, uh, this man. Uh, I didn't have his email, though, so the only way I could do it was park in the parking lot every day. And um, so it took four days, and we finally overlapped, and I parked my car into the gate, and I got out, and I said, uh, Yile, now I know his name, um, I'd like your email. Uh, which he happily gave it to me, and I repeat our emails back and forth. Uh, uh, we had a, a rather funny exchange to begin with. And um, that night I went home and I sent him an email, and uh, I basically said, um, uh, I'm ready to teach you how to write a column uh, if you will tell me your life story. Uh, and he basically said, I see you're proposing a deal. I like this deal. Okay. And, um, <laughs> So uh, he asked me to meet near, near his, uh, his work uh, at Pete's Coffee House in Bethesda. 
And uh, two weeks later, I was actually going to the Middle East, and I came back. And uh, we met at Pete's, and um, I handed him a six-page memo on how to write a column. And he told me his life story. Uh, uh, it's a wonderful story. He's a democracy activist, uh, student, graduate of Haile Selassie University in economics. Uh, we're roughly the same age. I'm 63, 60, I think he's 63. Um, and uh, was a blogging on, he, he basically, his activism led him essentially to be expelled from Ethiopia by the authoritarian regime. Uh, he gained political asylum in America, was working in the parking garage just to make money, uh, basically, so he could sustain uh, his activism through the internet. Uh, he was blogging on Ethiopian websites, but they were too slow for him. They wouldn't turn his stuff around fast enough. So he decided to start his own blog, and now, Mr. Friedman, I feel empowered. Uh, his Google metrics say he's read in 30 countries, uh, which is amazing. It's an amazing story of participation and the ability of anyone to participate. And I really felt we, we met like uh, just two global columnists writing about the world. And um, uh, it, was, um, uh, it was a real insight for me into uh, how much the platform has changed and just how easily now uh, so many people can participate. Um, I then handed him my six-page memo on how to write a column, and we had actually three sessions uh, over time and uh, on email on this. And so if, um, if the world is a big data problem, uh, what I'm about to share with you is my algorithm. Uh, it's how I, as a columnist, uh, write a column. And everyone does it differently, uh, but this is how I go about organizing the world, I explained to him. Uh, so I explained to uh, Eli that a news story is meant to inform and I can do so better or worse, I could write about CGU and um, uh, you'd read it and say, he informed better or worse. Uh, but a column is actually meant to provoke. Uh, I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. So that's uh, what I do, okay? I either do heating or lighting. Um, I'm either stoking up an emotion in you or illuminating something for you. And if I really do it well, I'm doing both and producing both heat and light and producing a reaction. And, um, but what I explained to him is that to produce heat and light requires actually an act of chemistry. Because uh, a news story comes to you. It's an event and you write about it. But a, a column actually has to be conjured. It has to be conjured by an act of chemistry. And you have to combine three compounds. Uh, the first is, what is your value set? Are you a communist, a capitalist, a neocon, a neoliberal, a libertarian, a Marxist, a Keynesian? What is the value set you are trying to promote in the world? Second, how do you think the machine works? So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places in more ways on more days? Uh, as a columnist, I'm always carrying around a working hypothesis of what, uh, how I think the machine works. Uh, once I called it Lex Sinaltri, once I called it Worlds of Flat, all of these books, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, they're actually just a um, picture of the mental image I have of how the big gears and pulleys of the world are working. Because as a columnist, you're trying to take your value set and push the machine. And if you don't know how the machine works, you'll either not push it or you'll push it in the wrong direction. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? Because there's no column without people and there's no people without culture. How the machine affects people and culture. You know, people and culture come back and affect the machine. Stir those together, let it rise, bake for 45 minutes, and if you do it right, you will produce heat or light. You'll produce a reaction. And you will know you've produced a reaction by what you hear and feel from readers coming back at you. Uh, some might say, uh, I didn't know that, that's a good reaction. Some might say, I never looked at it that way, that's a good reaction. Uh, some might say, I never connected those things. That's a good reaction. Uh, your favorite, you live for this, it happens four times a year. Uh, people say, uh, you said exactly what I felt, but I didn't know how to say, it. God bless you. Uh, sometimes they say, I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring. Um, uh, that also tells you you've produced heat or light. So any of these reactions um, uh, uh, will work. Um, so the more Ayili and I went back and forth, and the more I thought of how to explain all this to him, and this is exactly what happened, uh, the more I said to myself, um, well, if that's what a column is, what is my value set? Where did it come from? 
And those of you who read me know that I'm not, not, con I'm not exactly a liberal, but I'm, I'm certainly not a conservative. I have my own quirky politics, very heterodox, because my politics actually does not come from a philosopher, a book, or a library. It actually emerges from the time and place where I grew up in Minnesota, uh, a small suburb outside of Minneapolis, because I grew up in a time and place where politics worked. And that's what actually has influenced me more than anything else, which is my, my chapter on that book, uh, which is about my philosophy, is called Always Looking for Minnesota, because uh, that's basically what I've been doing for 40 years. Um, how do I think the machine works today? And what have I learned about people and culture in 40 years as a journalist for the New York Times. And I decided that was the book I wanted to write. I will tell you, though, there's a personal subtext to the book. Uh, the personal subtext is that um, I spent about 30 years covering the Middle East uh, of my life. And um, I got to witness some of the great events there. Uh, I was on the White House lawn for the Oslo Peace Agreement. I was in Tahrir Square uh, for the uh, uprising there. I covered the Arab Spring. Uh, covered uh, the Iraq War, um, uh, hoped it would end well, it didn't. Um, and after about 30 years, I decided that um, uh, kind of nothing I was supporting was working. And maybe um, uh, I needed to take my idealism and invest it somewhere else. So I, I started writing about America, nation building at home. My last book was uh, um, uh, That Used to Be Us. Uh, how America lost its way in the world and invented it, how we can come back. And then over the last um, seven, eight years, I started to feel like um, uh, the Middle East was coming to America, that we were turning into Sunnis and Shiites. We just called it Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we, were, we were acting the same way. People were saying, I would never let one of my kids marry one of them. And they were, they were actually talking about someone from another political party. And um, I, I began to hate Washington, D.C. And, um, uh, and basically what happened was I started to drift back and try to rekindle my idealism by going back to the place and time where I realized I had been the most happy. And that was the time and place in this town and community I grew up in called St. Louis Park. And that's why the subtext of this book is a journey back home to discover whether it was as good as I remembered it. And, um, and if it was, to share those lessons uh, with my readers in the world. So let me talk uh, in more detail a little bit about the book, and we can open up for questions. The, um, uh, let me talk about the central engine of all this. The first part of the book is how the machine works, and the second half is about how it's reshaping the world. So my argument is that, um, the way I think the machine works today, what's shaping more things in more places, in more ways on more days, is that we are in the middle of three nonlinear accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, mother nature, and Moore's law. So uh, Moore's law, coined by Gordon Moore in 1965, said that the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months. It's now closer to 30. Never mind, it's held up. It's the most powerful exponential in the world today. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. You know, one of the hardest things for the human mind to grasp is actually the power of an exponential, because we rarely encounter uh, the second derivative in our, in our daily life. Uh, and so the um, engineers at Intel wants to demonstrate the power of an exponential, because uh, it's hard to grasp the power of doubling of microchips. Uh, they took a 1971 VW Beetle, and on the back of an envelope, they tried to estimate what a v 1971 VW Beetle would operate like today if it improved at the rate of Moore's Law. And they, um, uh, they determined that it would go 300,000 miles per hour, uh, it would get 2 million miles per gallon, and it would cost 4 cents. Um, <laughs> and you'd be able to drive it your entire life on one tank of gas. Um, that's the power of, uh, of Moore's Law. So it's a, it looks like a hockey stick. Uh, the market for me is digital globalization, not your grandfather's globalization. Containers on ships, that's actually going down. But the globalization that's actually weaving the world from interconnected to interdependent is digital globalization. Everything that's now being digitized and globalized 
uh, whether it's MOOCs, whether it's PayPal, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, we are now digitizing everything and it immediately goes global and that's what's driving globalization today, what I call the market. And, Moore's, and Mother Nature, of course, is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth. If you put the market digital globalization on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. If you put Mother Nature on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. We're in the middle of three hockey stick accelerations all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, and they're all interacting with one another. Because more and more's law drives more globalization, more globalization drives more climate change, and more solutions to climate change. So um, my, my, gra my, my um, uh, chapter on Moore's Law, I then break up, I have three chapters, one on each of these accelerations. And my chapter on Moore's Law is actually called What the Hell Happened in 2007? 2007, 2007. Sounds like such an innocuous year. Well, here's what happened in 2007. In January 2007, at the Moscone Center in San Francisco, Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone for the first time, beginning a process by which we're now putting in the hands of, eventually, probably every person on the planet, a handheld computer you can hold in the palm of your hand connected to the internet and this thing we call the cloud. Here's what else also happened in 2007. Actually, late 2006, a company called Facebook, um, which had been confined to colleges and universities, opened itself to any user with a registered email address. And it exploded globally in 2007. In 2007, a company called Twitter, which was formed in 2006, uh, launched on its own independent platform in 2007 and went global. In 2007, the most important software you've never heard of, um, called Hadoop, uh, launched its uh, first algorithm onto the world. Uh, it's named after the company's a founder's son's toy elephant. Um, uh, and um, uh, Hadoop is the software which um, basically gave the world the ability to connect a million computers so they would operate as one. And it created the foundation for big data for everybody outside of Google. Uh, basically, Google pioneered this, but as Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, says, uh, Google lives in the future and sends us letters back. And um, uh, what they, Google did was um, send a letter back to the open source community, the basic breadcrumb pathway to recreate their uh, big data foundation uh, by an open source algorithm. And um, we suddenly had the foundation of, uh, of big data. In 2007, the second most important software company you've never heard of uh, called GitHub opened its doors. Uh, it is now today the world's biggest a repository of open source software. And just about every major company now uh, develops software directly and indirectly through GitHub. Uh, in 2007, a company called Google uh, uh, opened and unleashed into the wild an operating system called Android. Uh, in 2007, the same company called Google bought an obscure TV company called YouTube. Uh, in 2007, um, Jeff Bezos, uh, gave the world the first ebook reader called the Kindle. Uh, in 2007, IBM started the world's first cognitive computer called Watson. Uh, in 2007, three design students in San Francisco um, decided to rent out their spare air mattresses to some people attending the design conference who couldn't get a hotel room. It worked out so well, they started in 2007 Airbnb. Uh, in 2007, Palantir launched its first algorithm, change.org started. Michael Dell retired in 2005, came back to work in 2007. Uh, here's what else happened in 2007. Solar energy began to take off in 2007. Um, let's see if we can get this clicker working. Ah, oh, there it is. Um, this is the cost of um, uh, generating a megabit of data. That's the white line. This is basically social networking. In a, in a nutshell. So what happens is in, two, in what year is that? Oh, 2007, yeah. The cost of <laughs> generating a megabit of data collapses. Um, and uh, in the same year, the speed at which you can s dispatch a megabit of data uh, explodes and the two lines cross in 2008. Um, uh, close enough for government work. Um, uh, keep going. 
Uh, this is what Moore's Law looks like. Let me just go backwards because we're missing the first slide here. See if we can find it. It's quite important. All right, I'll just go forward. The cloud started in 2007. Um, uh, the first year it actually shows up statistically is 2008, so it actually began in 2007. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead from these slides, or maybe we'll get to the first one. Uh, this is the cost of sequencing a human genome. Uh, in 2001, it was $100 million. Uh, you'll notice it hits a waterfall and goes straight down in uh, 2007, okay? <laughs> Uh, down toward $1,200. Turns out that 2007 may be known in time as the single greatest technological inflection point since Gutenberg invented the printing press, and we completely missed it because of 2008. <laughs> so right when we hit a, we, it was like we were on a moving sidewalk at the airport that suddenly went from five miles an hour to 35 miles an hour. Our physical technologies just leapt ahead. All of our, what Eric Beinhacker calls our social technologies, regulation, deregulation, politics, political reform, management, learning, so much of that froze because the next year we went into the worst economic crisis since the Depression. And we are living right now in that dislocation. So I was talking about this with, um, let me just get to the, with Astro Teller, who runs Google X. And um, he went over to his whiteboard and just did this crude uh, etching of where we are. So the blue line is the average rate, Astro said, at which human beings and societies adapt to change over time. It's very gradual, but it does have a positive slope. The white line is technology. You know, if you lived in the 11th century or 12th century, if you lived at the left end of that line, Nothing actually changed. We forget there were, you could go a whole century and basically nothing changed. And then we get Galileo and Copernicus and Intel and the whole thing and the line starts to go straight north. And then Astro drew this little diamond and he wrote the words, we are here. That we're now actually moving that the, because we're, being driven by an exponential, the change in the pace of change now is so fast <coughs> that it's above the average rate at which a lot of human beings and societies can adapt. And I will tell you, in writing this book, I had an experience I've never had in writing a book, and I've written about technology for a long time. I felt I had a butterfly net, and I was chasing a butterfly, and every time I got close, it moved. So I had to interview Brian Krasanich, the head of Intel, three times during the course of this book, just to make sure that everything was up to date. I interviewed Chris Wanstroth, Doug Cutting, I mean, from, Chris Wanstroth from GitHub, Doug Cutting from Hadoop. I don't remember how many times, just to make sure, it was almost monthly. In fact, um, Chris Wanstroth, every time I'd call him, he'd say, we have another million users on GitHub. It's not 11 now, it's 12, then it was 13. I think, I felt like I needed an odometer on the page to keep pace with what was going on. So I was actually living that. So then Astro went up and he drew, took out another magic marker and he drew a little dotted line. And he called that learning faster and governing smarter. And he argued that's the basic social and political challenge we face today. How do we enable more people to accelerate their learning and governing in order to keep pace with a changing pace of change? And that's a lot of what uh, the book is about. How did 2007 happen? Well, basically, I argue that the computer has five parts. It has the CPU, the processor. It has a storage chip. It has networking. It has software. And it has a sensor. It has many parts. But those are the five key parts. In fact, all five have been in a Moore's Law. And they all basically come together in 2007 into this thing we call the cloud. The cloud. But I actually don't use the word the cloud in my book because it sounds so soft, so, so fluffy, so cuddly, so benign. It sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. <laughs> I've looked at clouds from, this ain't no cloud. Uh, uh, in the book, I, I rename it actually Craig Mundy, the former CTO of Microsoft, 
calls it a supernova. Supernova is the largest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. Only this is an ever expanding and accelerating supernova. And it really now is at the center of so much of these accelerations and what's happening. I mean, if you think, where did you want to build your town in the Middle Ages? You wanted to build it on a river. Because the flows of that river created transportation, brought ideas, brought nourishment, and brought power. You want to build your town on the Amazon. Where do you want to build your town today? On Amazon.com. <laughs> you, you want to build it on the flows coming off this supernova. Because it's now a world of what John Hagel calls, it's a world of flows now, not a world of stocks. That it's being in touch with these flows that are now the key drivers of so much economic activity today. So um, that's basically uh, the story of the Moore's Law acceleration. I then tell the same story of globalization. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, and I tell the same story of Mother Nature. Uh, and my argument is that these three accelerations are not just changing the world. They are reshaping the world. And they're reshaping five realms simultaneously. Politics, geopolitics, ethics, the community, and the workplace. And so the first half of the book is about these accelerations, and the back half is about how all five are being reshaped and how I think they need to be reimagined. And that's why it's important to slow down and figure all this out. So I don't have time to go through all of them. I'll, I'll just do a couple just to give you an idea, and we can talk about the others in the, the Q&A. So the section on the workplace is called How We Turn AI into IA. How do we turn artificial intelligence into intelligent assistance, A-N-C-E, intelligent assistance, A-N-T-S, and intelligent algorithms so more people can uh, accelerate their learning and governing in the age of acceleration. So I'll give you my example of each one. The section on intelligent assistance uh, is built around the Human Resources Department of AT&T. 360,000 employees living right on the edge of the supernova, feels its heat every day, wakes up every morning, competes with Verizon and Sprint and Deutsche Telekom. So um, I spent a lot of time with their HR department, and basically this is the HR policy of AT&T today. Uh, their CEO, Randall Stevenson, begins the year with a radically transparent speech about how he sees the world, what businesses and markets AT&T is going to be in, and what skills you need to be an AT&T employee. Then they put everyone on their own uh, internal LinkedIn system. And uh, so they've got me on their LinkedIn system. I'm an employee. And um, they've broken down, I'm making up this number, I don't remember what the exact number is, but there are 10 skills you need to work in the AT&T of today. And they come to me and they say, Tom, 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 you have seven of the 10 skills we need, um, but you're missing three. Then they partnered with Sebastian Thrun from Audacity, who created online nano degrees for all 10. Uh, then they came to me and said, uh, we'll give you $8,500 a year, Tom. Uh, to take the nano degree courses for the skills you don't have on one condition. Uh, you have to take them on your own time. You have to take them after work, at night, early in the morning. But the deal we have now with you is if you take those courses, we will offer you the new jobs first. We will not go outside. If I say to them, you know, I've climbed up just one too many telephone poles and I'm just not up for this, they now have a wonderful severance package for me. But I won't be working at AT&T. So their new social contract with their employees is you can be a lifelong employee at AT&T, but only if you're a lifelong learner. Uh, and that is the social contract coming to a neighborhood near you. Uh, the job of the company, if it's a true social contract, the job of that company is to create both the courses, uh, the direction, and I think the resources to take those courses. The job of the employee is to take them on his or her own time. The job of the government is to enable the whole thing, but that is the new social contract. Um, and uh, it is coming uh, to a neighborhood near you. That is what I call intelligent assistance. Intelligent assistant, the example I use, is uh, Qualcomm. Uh, I profile Qualcomm and Erwin Jacobs, the um, founder of Qualcomm, in the networking part of my book, so I 
was spending a lot of time there. And one day I was there and I ended up talking to the um, head of their um, maintenance department. And he told me that they had just put sensors on uh, six buildings and they basically put sensors on every device of these buildings, every door, window, light, uh, HVAC system, pipe, uh, computer, absolutely everything. Uh, and then they beam all that data up to the supernova, and then they beam it down onto an iPad for their janitorial staff on a really user-friendly interface. Uh, so their janitors can now swipe down. They know if you left your computer on, if a pipe burst. They have the instructions all there, how to repair it or who to call. Um, their janitors are now maintenance technologists. They give tours to foreign visitors. Well, think of what that does for the dignity of the janitorial staff. They can live at a higher rate now because they have an intelligent assistant. Uh, my example of intelligent algorithm is the partnership between the College Board, and I'm sure Claremont has experienced this, and um, uh, Khan Academy. So uh, I'm 63, I have two girls, uh, they're blessedly out of college now and in the workforce. Uh, but when they were in 11th grade, um, uh, in, in uh, public school in Maryland, um, uh, we did that um, uh, really neurotic thing all parents do. We went out and hired a college kid to be their tutor for their PSAT to see if we could little goose their English and math scores. I know you did the same thing. It's um, uh, a completely rigged game, uh, basically. Because if you live in a neighborhood or came from a family uh, that couldn't afford this or didn't even know you could do it, um, you were at a huge disadvantage. It was a completely rigged game. So uh, two years ago, the College Board partnered with Sal Khan Khan Academy to create free online PSAT and SAT college prep. So now as an 11th grader, I take the PSAT exam, I get the results back, and, and Khan Academy says, Tom, you, you really did, you did pretty well on math, but you, you have a problem with fractions and right angles. Uh, it then takes me to a practice site just dedicated to fractions and right angles, just tailored perfectly for me. If I do well there, it comes back and says, Tom, have you ever thought of taking AP math? Well, as a matter of fact, I haven't, because there's no one in my life who ever took AP math. I didn't even know what AP math was. It says, I can take AP math. If I do well there, it takes me to another site with over 180 college scholarships on it now. And another site connects me to the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, where there are tutors ready to work with me to help me through this process all for free. Last year, two million American kids availed themselves of free SAT prep in the partnership between Khan Academy and the College Board. You heard nothing about any of this during a year and a half campaign. Uh, you heard nothing of this because um, Bernie Sanders' big idea was to destroy the banks, the big banks. Donald Trump's big idea was to destroy Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton's big idea was to tell you to go to her website, okay? <laughs> but nobody was telling you at all that there's actually massive social entrepreneurship going on within and outside companies around how to turn AI into IA. And I only gave you a fraction of what's in that chapter. There is an explosion of entrepreneurship around this issue. So I'll let you go to the chapter to read it all, but people are doing amazing things. You would never know it, though, from the political discussion in this country. So let me talk to briefly about the chapter on ethics, and then we'll, we'll go to questions. Um, you might find it odd that in the age of acceleration, we need to rethink ethics. Uh, but boy, do we have to. So um, my chapter on that is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Uh, which comes from the best question I ever got on book tour, Portland, Oregon, I believe, 1999. I was selling Lexus in the olive tree. Man stood up at question time in the balcony and said, Mr. Friedman, I have a question. Is God in cyberspace? I said, ah, 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 ah. I have no idea. I'd never been asked that before. And I felt like kind of an idiot. So I went home and I called my spiritual guide. He's a rabbi I got to know, a great Talmudic scholar at, uh, when I was a New York Times correspondent in Jerusalem, his name's Svi Marx, very interesting character. He's married to a Dutch priest, lives in Amsterdam. 
And I called him in Amsterdam and I said, Svi, I got a question I've never had before. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have said? And he said, well, Tom, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty, uh, a biblical and a post-biblical. The biblical concept says the Almighty is Almighty. He smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, criminality, and we know from this election, fake news, okay? <laughs> but he said, we fortunately have a post-biblical view of God, which says that God manifests himself by how we behave. So if we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. I liked his answer. I wrote it up into the paperback edition of Lexus and the Olive Tree, and nobody saw it. And I completely <laughs> forgot about it. Okay. Well, I started working on this book three years ago, and I suddenly found myself retelling that story everywhere I went. And I finally sat down and said, why are you retelling that story now? And the answer became clear to me, and it became crystal clear in this election. It's because so much of our lives have now migrated to cyberspace, a, a realm where we're all connected, but nobody's in charge. That's now where we teach. It's now where we find a date, a spouse, a friend, how we communicate with families, how we do commerce, how we educate. It's all moving to cyberspace. We're all connected there, but nobody's in charge. There is no value set there. And boy, didn't you see that in this election, where our election was hacked by another country, we think. Or maybe it was just a group of guys and gals somewhere. We don't know. Fake news. We just had a guy shoot up a pizza parlor in my neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Uh, because he thought a story that was purveyed by our future national security advisor <laughs> that Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile ring in the back room of Comet Pizza, he thought that was news. That entire interaction happened in cyberspace. So the question of what values prevail in cyberspace now is more important than ever, especially when the accelerations are also amplifying the power of machines and the power of one. Well, if you want to make something today, you were born, you are going to Claremont at exactly the right time. But if you want to break something today, you're also living at exactly the right time. We have a president-elect who can sit in his penthouse at Trump Tower and through Twitter communicate directly, unmediated by any news organization, with tens of millions of people from Trump Tower. But we're also living in a world where the head of ISIS can do the same from Raqqa province. So if you want to be a maker or a breaker today, you were born at the right time, and therefore, what values everybody has now matter more than ever. To put it specifically, the golden rule has never been more relevant. Now I know what you're thinking. I gave this talk as the commencement address at Olin College of Engineering last spring, this part of the talk. And I said to the parents, I know what you're thinking. You paid 200 grand so your kid could get an engineering degree and there is a knucklehead commencement speaker here talking to us about the golden rule. <laughs> is there anything more naive? And my answer is naivete is the new realism in the age of acceleration. Because you want to know what's really naive? Thinking we're going to be OK in a world where individuals have this much amplified power and it's growing with that supernova, where we're all interconnected if everybody doesn't get the golden rule, whatever version their faith has, and every faith has some version of do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you. So when I step back, I finally concluded that we're actually sitting at a moral intersection in the age of accelerations we've never sat at before. We are now entering, in 1945, we entered a world where one country, post Hiroshima, could kill all of us. It had to be one country, I'm glad it was mine. I think we're entering a world where one person can kill all of us, and all of us could actually fix everything. The same amplified powers are enabling one of us, eventually, to kill all of us, and all of us to actually feed, house, clothe, and educate every person on the planet. 
We have never stood at this intersection before where one of us could kill all of us and all of us could fix everything. What does that mean? We have never been more godlike as a species. And if we are godlike, everybody needs to have that golden rule. Where does the golden rule come from? Golden rule comes from, I think, two primary places, strong families and healthy communities. That's where people learn to do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you. I'm not an expert on strong families. I uh, hope I built one, but I would never presume to lecture anyone about how you do that. Everyone has to find their own way. Uh, but I am an expert on healthy communities, because I grew up in one. And that's why the book ends back in the little town, uh, in a suburb in Minnesota called St. Louis Park, uh, where I grew up. And I have two chapters. So um, the first chapter, I explained that uh, in Minnesota, um, uh, Minneapolis was the capital of anti-Semitism in the 30s and 40s until Hubert Humphrey became mayor and cleaned it out of city government, a great hero in our household. Um, Humphrey, before he promoted civil rights between blacks and whites, actually uh, practiced on anti-Semitism. And in the 50s after the war, all the men came home. Uh, the Jews all lived in a ghetto in, in the north side of Minneapolis. I called the north side. My parents actually, this was... There was no busing, but they went to school with uh, many, many African Americans because they were all basically uh, frozen in the same ghetto. And in the mid-50s, in a three-year period, all the Jews move out en masse. The African Americans couldn't get out. And they, all the Jews moved to one suburb, the only one that had no redlining, uh, covenants, and could take them all. And they all moved. My aunt and uncle would live two doors down. My other uncle lived another door down. They all moved to St. Louis Park. So overnight, a suburb that was 100% Protestant Catholic Scandinavian becomes 20% Jewish, 80% Protestant Catholic Scandinavian. So if Sweden and Israel had a baby, it would be St. Louis Park, okay? <laughs> um, uh, we, the Jews of this frozen plain, called ourselves the Frozen Chosen. And, um, uh, um, and we had a little experiment in inclusion of uh, basically these neurotic Jews thrown together with these incredibly decent pluralistic Swedes and out of that came was a, a quite an amazing explosion of creativity because uh, I uh, grew up in the same neighborhood went through the same school system or went to the same Hebrew school with the Cone brothers Al Franken Norm Ornstein Michael Sandel Peggy Ornstein, Sharon Isbin, Alan Wiseman, Dan Wilson, who wrote Someone Like You with Adele, the Hauptmann brothers, um, uh, the, the country's leading stamp designers. It was a freaky place. <laughs> this was not a neighborhood in the Upper West Side of New York. This was a one high school town outside of Minneapolis. And um, the Coen Brothers movie, A Serious Man, was about our town. Um, in fact, if you go see No Country for Old Men, and you remember the scene where Churga blows up a car outside of a pharmacy in Mexico so he can steal painkillers inside. Look at the name of the pharmacy. It's called Mike Sauce Drugs. That was our local drugstore. <laughs> so I tell the story of how all these people built an inclusive community. Then I come back 40 years later. And uh, now my high school is 50% white Protestant Catholic, it's 10% Hispanic, 10% uh, Jewish, and now 30% Somali uh, and uh, African American. The same neighborhood that took the Jews was ready to take the Somalis uh, 40 years later. Now the inclusion challenge is so much deeper. Uh, it's racially more challenging and religiously more challenging. And I tell the story of how they're doing. And they're actually doing pretty well. Um, it's uh, uh, as I look at the challenge, I tell the whole story, I'm, I'm reminded of what my friend Amory Lovins, is a great physicist, uh, he is really my tutor on chapter on Mother Nature. Whenever he asks Amory, are you an optimist or a pessimist, he says, I'm neither. Because they're just two different forms of fatalism. Everything's going to be great, everything's going to be awful, you know. Um, and Amory says, uh, I believe in applied hope. And, um, uh, and I believe in applied hope. And what I've seen in St. Louis Park and in Minneapolis uh, is a lot of people applying hope. I don't know if it's going to work, and they don't know either. But what is so heartening to me and the source of my optimism 
is there are so many people who want to get caught trying. And that um, uh, is something I find actually in a lot of communities around this country. In fact, if you want to be an optimist in America, stand on your head. Because the country looks so much better from the bottom up than from the top down. Um, that all over this country was actually propelling us forward. Our healthy communities. We have troubled ones too. We saw that in this election. But we have a lot of healthy communities where people are coming together, Democrats and Republicans. They still have politics, but it's much more muted because there's no Republican water and no Democratic sewers. And at the end of the day, people have to govern and live together. And at the end of the day, there are an amazing number of healthy communities in this country. And that is my source of optimism. So let me conclude by sharing with you my book has a, has a theme song. I actually thought, could I buy it? And so when you open the book, it would play this song like a Hallmark card plays Happy Birthday. And um, uh, the song is by one of my favorite singers, Brandi Carlisle. Um, and um, uh, uh, she's a great country folk singer. And the song is called I. E-Y-E. -E. And the main refrain is, I wrapped your love around me like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. And I believe my three accelerations, they are a hurricane. I believe we just elected someone who thinks he can stop the wind, okay? That he can hold the hurricane back. I don't think that's the right strategy. I think you have to build an eye that moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of dynamic stability where people can feel connected, protected, and respected, and moves with the storm. That, for me, is the healthy community. I think the struggle in our country in the next four years, and probably globally, is going to be between the wall people and the eye people. And my book is a manifesto for the eye people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.